Welcome to the K20 Center's Zoom Into Your Career video series. These online career expos give students a way to explore many interesting careers and learn about their career options from volunteer professionals. Mike Holmes is a manufacturing jeweler and laser technician working at BC Clark in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, with over 49 years of experience in his field. Hello and welcome to Zoom Into Your Career. Today we have with us jeweler Mike Holmes, who will be sharing with us his work and his experiences. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you so that you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, I work for B.C. Clarks. I have been in the jewelry industry all my life. My dad uh, started with Clarks many years ago, and I'm a second generation jeweler at Oklahoma's oldest jeweler. So I guess the next slide. Uh, this is a picture of my dad. Uh, he was a master craftsman. Uh, here he is actually faceting the stone, which cuts the little faces on each individual side of the stone. He uh, grew up in a small town in Craig, Oklahoma, where he first gained his interest in jewelry. He made his first ring when he was five or six years old out in the barn. Can you imagine melting metal? as a young kid and deciding you want to make a ring out of it. Well, that's what he did. He uh, started very early age, pursued it and became a master jeweler. Next slide. Uh, what is an apprentice? Well, an apprentice is what I did with my dad from the time that I was a small child. I uh, Watched him work at home and it gave me the interest to carry it on. Nowadays, apprentice programs, you need to have a little bit of background knowledge of metals, have a, a thirst for the desire to create things with your hands, to uh, envision uh, different things that you may want to uh, you know, pick up a rock and look at it and say, how can I make something to wear with this rock? Uh, that's kind of what apprenticeship does. You know, it, it teaches basics. And then once you learn the basics, then you can expand on the basics. Um, I, next slide, please. There again, I, here I'm talking about uh, in high school when you were thinking geometry. I'll never use geometry. Well, I use geometry almost every day in what I do, looking for the correct angles, looking for, make sure everything's plumb. It's everything is square, up and down, sideways, in every other direction. Uh, the arts, I love the arts. Uh, you look at uh, the arts is all kinds of media, whether it's painting, sculpting, metal arts. I chose the sculpting and metal arts that uh, metal is, is just my media that I chose in the arts itself. Next slide. Here I'm constructing a ring. Uh, this is, I'll be using the lost wax uh, process. And as you can see on the one on the left, I've laid out a grid pattern. In the center, I've continued the grid pattern. And what this does, it gives me a reference points so that I can carve the ring like on the right side of the screen, the, the following picture. So you want everything equal. You want your parallels, parallels. You, you want all your angles to be correct. Proportions are correct. Um, the stuff, the material I'm using is a wax, and it is a disposable wax that will be uh, burned out in the oven in the next slide I'll show you. So here it is. On the left side, I have it treed up or sprued up so that the metal will have somewhere to go. The center slide shows uh, it it's called invested in the, the, the 
the wax patterns invested in investment. So what we've got here basically is I've, I've got the ring on the left and then I put the plaster of Paris type of material around it. Like I said a while ago, the wax is expendable. So I melt the wax out of the investment, which leaves a impression of exact mold of the ring that I carved out. The picture on the right shows that after I have cast in gold, so the little sprues, the little pink things you see give the gold an avenue to flow into the, the mold itself. Next slide, please. So this is after it's pretty well cleaned up, polished up. I've uh, left out a few steps in there that, um, that just show the basics of it. You, you cut off the sprues, you, you clean and polish it, sand it up, and then the G in the, <coughs> the customer's name was engraved on the top of the ring itself. The picture on the right shows the engraving machine. It uh, holds a ring in a jig, and then it's logged into the computer that you see on the computer screen in the center. And then the uh, diamond point comes down on top of the gold and engraves the G into the ring itself. Next slide. And there's the finished product. Nice, shiny, you can see it all. I was asked about the most high-tech tool that I use. Uh, jewelry has been around forever. I mean, it's it's found in the pyramids and it's found in South America. And these people that did this did a lot of things that we still look at today with the awes that you just can't imagine them doing them with, with unsophisticated tools. The laser weld here is what I have. It, it actually allows me to shoot a beam of laser light and uh, repair, put prongs on, size rings, size repair chains. This little machine is, is in the neighborhood of $25,000. And it's a, uh, it has a safety house and the little uh, black things you see in the front, you actually stick your hands on the inside of the machine itself. And so you're holding the work with your fingers. Next slide. We'll show the video. So this is a video of the machine. Okay, here we're putting on at the, the class mechanism of an earring. And it's all done right there in your fingers. You can see the little puff of smoke a little flash of light, poof, and it's attached. And it's it's an incredible piece of machinery that uh, allows you to do things that we could never do before. Just like they were, <coughs> I was amazed at the pyramid stuff, the stuff they find in pyramids, this piece of equipment would amaze him what it will do too. This is some of the tools that I use. As you can see, I've got several primitive hammers. These are just rawhide hammers, much like uh, the rawhide that your dog chew tool is made out of. I've got probably what, 25 or 30 pair of pliers up there. They all look the same, but they all do different things. Uh, they've been tailored to do one little item or multiples of items, but uh, the pliers are as, kind of extend the hand that you're doing all the work with. It allows you to bend the metal, shape the metal, create the metal. And uh, next slide, please. These are some things that I have <coughs> made. The one on the left is a alligator tooth. Uh, the guy was in Africa and harvested a alligator and wanted a little uh, adornment of his, uh, his remembrance of his trip. So I, I made the little holder on the left for a piece of the tooth. 
The one in the center with the two teeth there are elk teeth, which is actually a, a ivory. And the gentleman that harvested this wanted matching pendants. So I made uh, matching pendants out. That's 14 karat white gold with ruby set in the center. The next one is a wedding band that a friend of mine is a DeLorean nut. Many of you know the DeLorean from the movie uh, Back to the Future. He wanted a ring made out of a piece of DeLorean. So he cut me off a piece. I shaped it into a ring, beveled the edges, textured the center, and now he has a wedding band from his DeLorean uh, automobile. The final picture there on the right, uh, my wife and I, we were in uh, Northern California in the Great Redwoods area, and I picked up a leaf off the ground. And I looked at it and I thought that would make a beautiful pendant. So I, I carefully packed it with me. I brought it back to Oklahoma. I put it in the same process that I did the ring while ago, where I put it in an investment. I burnt that out, cast it in gold, and this is a an extremely got extremely lucky on how beautiful it is, but it's actual from the redwood trees in Northern California. Next slide, please. Here I <coughs> was asked to make a pair of earrings for a customer. So the top left-hand picture shows uh, the pieces of tubing that I've used. These are actual 14 karat gold tubing that I made I aligned the four, the center picture, top center, I aligned the four pieces of tubing and soldered them together. The next picture, top right, I've started adding prongs. I've added the center prongs to the tubing. And you can see the two little diamonds down there. I'm checking to make sure that the diamonds will actually fit in the tubing itself. The lower left hand, <coughs> shows all the prongs complete. I've soldered all the, what was it, two, four, eight prongs, or six prongs on the tubing. And then the one on the right, far right, I actually cut those two apart. So I've got two identical pairs for one piece of, one piece pair of earrings. And in the center, uh, in order to hold these, it's difficult to hold something in your hand. So I've got a material called shellac that I, you warm it up, you put the little uh, pieces of metal into it, and then you shape it around there so that you can set your stones in there. It uh, works great for holding a lot of little items that you normally you can't hold in your hand. Next slide, please. And there is a completed pair of earrings. The uh, large pearls at the bottom are South Sea pearls. I put a little chain in between them so that they can dangle around and kind of float around on our ears. And this is you know, a little bit of what I do. I, the customer had the pearls, but she wanted something different. So it gave me a chance to express my uh, craftsmanship and artisanship on something to make for the customer and she absolutely loved them. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, <coughs> bench jewelers like myself, uh, we work, you know, eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we're a, a breed of person that better like yourself because that's who you're talking to all day long is yourself. Your job is basically sitting at the bench. You saw all my tools earlier. It gives you a chance to see what I do. And I, uh, as you can see from the, the shots on the side, it says something about how difficult it is to find a job. Well, currently around this country, bench jewelers are in short supply 
high demand. Uh, if you're excellent at working with your hands and want to express yourself in metal, in jewelry, if you like working with things with your hands, you know, the jewelry business is great industry to get into. Uh, my family has been with this company for close to a hundred years. My dad worked here for 57 years and I've been here 42. So you add that up, we're getting close to a hundred. My mother and brother both also worked for the family. Uh, the pay is is very, uh, is, is good. You know, it, it gives you the ability to do what you want to do. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> current, you know, it says associations and organizations. <clears throat> I'm the past president of the Oklahoma Jewelers Association. I've been on the board of uh, directors for the past 25 years. Uh, our store is a member of the American Gem Society, which gives the store accreditation to the industry. Jewelers of America kind of kind of helps set that uh, in concrete also. Jewelers of America is an organization of jewelers across the country that are striving for the same thing, honesty and integrity and to uh, promote the jewelry business. Uh, next slide, please. What do, you, what do you need to start making jewelry? Uh, in high school, you should have some kind of arts background. Uh, like I said earlier, sculpting, uh, whether in pottery is uh, very good because you get a chance to work with your hands, learn what your hands can do, make sure your hands can do what your mind can conceive. Uh, it's very difficult. To, to master the two, I'm still working on it daily, but I, I, it's a job that I truly love because you get to see smiley faces at the end of the day. You know, when, when the, the girl gets her engagement ring or the, the guy gets his uh, tooth back that he shot in uh, Africa, you know, it's just, there's a lot of self-satisfaction in being able to make something and create it with your hands. Uh, you start early. I mean, you, I'm sure your, your school has some kind of a, an art program that you can uh, enroll in and, and just learn how to, to work with your hands, your, your imagination. There's nothing your imagination can't do and that your hands can't help you complete it with. Next slide, please. All right. So, uh Thank you so much for sharing that. We have some questions uh, to ask. Let's see. Um, what was your favorite thing about learning from your dad? Well, just being able to, you know, to see somebody that at the time I didn't realize how good my dad was and what he did. Uh, to sit there, you know, he made things look so easy that you're first starting out, you kind of struggle to do, but you learn how to do it. But the best part of it was just knowing that uh, your dad was well respected in his field and he just enjoyed it. And you could see the look in his eye that when he showed it to me that, you know, he, I didn't realize that he was instructing me, but as I was watching, you're kind of, you're, you're learning how to do it at the same time. So it, it's a great was a great opportunity to work with my dad. A lot of people don't get to work with their dad. And for me, it was a great opportunity. And then, oh, um, can you tell us about what we see in this slide here, this diamond? Okay, <clears throat> this diamond is one of the largest that I have worked with. The penny is there just for a perspective of size. Uh, this diamond, uh, is called the 1892. Our, the company I worked for, BC Clarks, was actually started in 1892. So the significance of the starting date and the carat weight of this stone 
or hand in hand. Uh, as you can tell, you pull out a penny and look at it, that's, that's a big diamond. It was uh, cut by one of the world famous diamond cutters. It is actually a fancy intense yellow and it is a BBSI, very slightly included. So it's about as top notch of diamond and the color is an intense color. So it gives a rarity and value to the stone itself. In other words, it's a honker. Next and, question. Um, let's see here. Uh, where did you go to college? I went to college in Paris, Texas. It, it is a jewelry school and watchmaking school so that you can, if you have either interest in the business, you can go to both. Uh, it is now a two-year two associate's degree. When you come out of there, then you apply for apprenticeship. And the apprenticeship gives you the basics of what to do. I mean, you know, you never know what's going to come in off the street as far as you know, how to fix you know how to fix this or how to set that or or whatever so paris was a great opportunity to for me to learn the basics of what i do now for a living and then um we had a question about the uh laser uh wondering if you've ever had to like hit your fingers with it when you're working on something does it hurt how do you how do you stay safe with such a, a big machine the machine several years ago, I knew it was inevitable that sometime or another I was going to shoot my finger whether I wanted to or not. So I decided that that time within the first few days that I would do it self-inflicted just to get me over the fear of, you know, if you live with the fear of not facing it, then, you know, something bad will happen. So I shot my finger and it's kind of like getting, uh, you know, I don't know whether you're stuck a battery to your tongue. It's kind of like that little jar, just a little ping to it. The size of the beam in diameter is seven tenths of a millimeter. Now your average mechanical pencil is seven tenths of a millimeter in diameter. So you're using a very small beam, but it's got a lot of power behind it. And it's basically just kind of like pricking your finger. I mean, it just, it, you know it's there, it, it doesn't bring blood. It's just it kind of the first time it kind of startles you. After that, you kind of get used to doing it. Uh, you always want to miss your finger because it will definitely uh, get your attention. And Next question. one other question about the laser. So I, you noticed that you have to look through like binoculars or something. So is it difficult to gauge where your hands are in that machine when you're having to look through that? Well, when you're first starting out, uh, just locating your hands inside the machine, you are looking through a, a binocular microscope that is about 30 power. So everything in there, you know, a little bit of thin piece of wire, you know, looks like a piece of lumber in there. I mean, it, it, it blows up so big coordinating your hands between your eyes when you really can't see your hands other than through a binocular just takes a little bit of getting used to orientation to find out where your hands is. Sometimes it's difficult to, to find your hands in there because you're, you're holding two pieces of metal or you're holding a wire in, in a ring and you're trying to make the two meet. Uh, you got to have very steady hands to do this. You know, there's uh, a lot of the steadiness is comes from the confidence of having done it before that you are quite aware of you know making things go at the same time so you're if you, if you shake a little bit you your both hands want to shake at the same time but this thing works on such a small scale that the slightest movement will mean that you're actually missing where you're you're shooting your your target at the target is, it has crosshairs in the binoculars themselves so that you can see where the beam is going to hit. And it's so, um, all of this sounds, you know, tricky to us. Um, 
what's the toughest project you feel like you've ever worked on and what made it hard? Well, <clears throat> the toughest project, well, the toughest project is the one that the customer brings a stone in that they got on vacation in South America, that they want to make something that is unique for themselves, uh, yet strong, durable, wearable every day. So, you know, you sit down with your customer, you, you talk to them, find out what they're wanting, if they want to add diamonds to it, or if they want to add another color to it. Uh, colors, the stones come from all over the world. It's, it's amazing what Mother Nature gives us out of the ground. The, uh, I've had a customer that brought stones in, that they brought in from South America. They're on vacation in Brazil. They went to the emerald dealer down there. The emerald dealer said, this is the finest emerald in the world. So they bring it to me and <clears throat> I designed a little mounting to, to stick it into. The problem is when you're doing something like that, first of all, it's a customer stone. They got it on vacation. So there's a lot of sentimental value to it along with the monetary value of it too. So you want to make sure that you, you start off with one piece they brought in and when it's complete, it's still on one piece. Uh, a lot of stones are very fragile. Emeralds are very fragile. So you've got to make sure that everything fits just right before you decide to uh, tighten that stone. There is no glue that holds the stones in. It's just metal on stone. Uh, so you got to have the, the right geometry of the stone, I mean of the prong, to fit the geometry of the stone. So there it comes the, the complicated part is that finding out what the customer wants, what the customer desires, uh, what color metal does she want white gold, does she want yellow gold, maybe platinum, rose gold, you know, gold comes in several colors and it's all done through alloys in the metal itself. Uh, all gold starts off as 24 karat and the alloys is what changes its colors. Next question. Um, what kinds of skills do you think would make someone more employable as a bench jeweler? What do you, when people are looking for a job, which skills do you think stand out the most? Well, you gotta be a, a people person. You gotta be able to talk to people. Uh, and you've got to be able to before you can get a job, they will test you just like any other job that you interview for. Uh, make sure that you do have good hand-eye coordination, uh, that you can convey what you want and what the customer wants and make them into one package. Um, so they're really looking for the thirst of knowledge in the jewelry business. I mean, this, I've been doing this all my life. I enjoy every day of it, but I still learn something every day. It's just, you would think after doing it this long that you've learned it all. Well, it's not like a lot of things that you can just learn it all. You learn every day. I learn something from everybody I talk to. So it's a, it's a great field for, you know, I feel like I'm a sponge where I want to soak up the knowledge because, you know, every day someone's come up with a new technique to do this, do that. So I've taken seminars all over the country from the greatest minds in the jewelry business that uh, I can learn just a little bit from them and apply it to my trade, how I do my day in, day out job. Well, we really appreciate you sharing all the work you do uh, with us today, and we want to thank you for your time. I think that our students are going to really uh, get a lot from seeing this career and all the opportunities it provides. So once again, thank you so much for taking part in this today. Well, thank you for asking me, and, and I hope some of uh, if this touches somebody and they will want to be a bench jeweler also. Thank you.